Work-related stress is costing the U.S. $300 billion annually. Theft in the workplace is rampant. Remorse is rare. Creativity in children is largely destroyed by the second grade. Stress has been linked to all the leading causes of death, including heart disease, cancer, accidents, and Many suicide. managers won't empower subordinates to make decisions for fear of losing power and stature. Estimated workers are absent on an average work day because of stress-related... Seventy-six percent of workers who quit in the first 12 months do so because of dissatisfaction satisfaction with their work environment or 70 to 75 percent of all retail thefts stress is in the Growth climate has solutions. Growth climate has set the standard in personal and professional development. Growth climate training will give you more confidence, more job satisfaction, increased profits, and stronger personal and professional relationships. Growth climate, the standard in personal and professional development. I had the privilege a few years back of spending a week with about 60 exceptional uh, American Indian youth, youth leadership program. At the end of the week, we spent some time with one of this group, and as we finished eating, uh, she said to me, can I tell you a joke? And I said, please do. This was a six foot three, 17 year old Lakota Sioux girl. And she started the joke. She said, a white man was walking along a road one day and saw an Indian with his ear to the ground. And he said, you don't mean to tell me that uh, you Indians can tell things with the ear to the ground now, do you? And without moving, the old Indian said, two wagons. First wagon pulled by six horses, driver old man, sitting beside him, small boy. Second wagon pulled by two oxen, driver middle-aged man, both wagons carrying grain. And the astounded white man said, you can tell all of that just with the ear to the ground? And the old Indian said, no, wagons run over me 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Things are not always as they appear, are they? Nowhere is this more true than in the field of human relations. Let me tell you something about the birth of growth climate. It actually had its beginnings in the fall of 1974. At the time, I was working full time as a tour guide in the Middle East and I was with a group of some 50 tourists sitting on lush, plush uh, Persian carpets in a Bedouin tent on the northern edge of the Negev in southern Israel. We were being hosted by an Arab sheikh and his family. On those kinds of occasions, I usually sat back just absolutely enjoying the way the tour group was being fascinated by the unique differences between the culture of this Bedouin society and their own. On this particular day, there was something unusually different for me. I found myself, instead of being amused by my tourists' reactions, I found myself being absolutely intrigued and fascinated at what I was seeing as some very, very unique similarities. As I watched this noble old gentleman, I said to myself, what is it about this man? that reminds me so much of an executive I knew in London, England. I thought next of the owner of a large factory in Wichita, Kansas, and I thought there's something about him that I see in this Arab Sheikh as well. And then I thought of another man in Salt Lake City, one in Portland, Oregon, one in Canada. And I began from that moment for the next three years an observation project looking to see what it was that had appeared so mysteriously almost to me in that setting where I found myself seeing a man in a totally different culture, a different kind of country, not the same kind of dress. I doubt that this particular man had ever been out of the Negev. They hadn't gone to the same schools. They certainly weren't from the same ethnic or religious background. Their cultures were different. And yet somehow in all of that differentness was a sameness that intrigued me. What I came to realize was, after that day and many other days and months of observation, that the significant similarity 
was in the belief and the value system of the individuals. And then when you look at a person's belief and value system, if they are the same, you will sense a similarity. Not necessarily in how they look or how they walk, but in the feeling that comes from those individuals. I have began to see also another very, very interesting phenomenon. And that is that if you could watch a person's behavior long enough over time, you could write down the belief and value system of that individual almost without error. On the flip side of that, if you were to tell me what a person's belief and value system is, I could predict almost without error the conduct or behavior of that individual in any setting. That is really how linked those two are. Our beliefs and our behavior are flawlessly tied together. The observation process, though it began in 74, has never really quit. I've been at that observation process full time since then. The end result of that, actually with its birth in 1981, was growth climate. The end result at this point, after over 25 years of that observation, is the course that you now attend, The Anatomy of Human Interaction. The value of this course will be seen in many ways. What you will see is that in the interaction pattern of individuals, and that interaction pattern or style will be based on the belief and value system of those involved will have an impact on those with whom they interface. It has a very powerful effect. When we can come to understand the impact of our own belief and value system, perhaps then we can make some very powerful changes in the way in which we deal with other people. We have in our group here tonight people from many different walks of life. We have parents, and of course, they, some are home-type parents. That, that's where they spend their time. There are those who work at home and work also in the business arena. We have people in the helping profession. We have people in law enforcement. We have people who are businessmen. And in each of those settings, if we were to take the material on human interaction, the anatomy of human interaction, you will come to understand what will impact where you are, whether it's on the home front, whether it's in a school as a school teacher, whether it's in a caregiver setting working with troubled youth, all of those settings will find value in understanding the anatomy of human interaction. I'd like to begin with a, a metaphor, a three-part analogy, if you will, and, uh, and pull together a couple of concepts. If you were to go home tonight, for example, and find a member of your family with a fever of 102 degrees, and you decided you wanted to do something about that fever, short of calling a doctor, what remedies might you try? What would you do? Anyone? A cool bath, perhaps? What else? Aspirin. Yeah. Aspirin. Something else. What other remedy? Loosen the clothing. These and many other dozens of remedies, and it depends where you are in the country, have as its target to drop the fever. Now, once in a while, we give one dose of one of those things, the temperature drops and stays dropped. All it was was a glitch in the system. In fact, the human body's defense mechanism at the invasion of some foreign organism is to draw, uh, bring about a rise in temperature of two or three degrees, and it kills it. So if it drops and stays dropped, not a problem. However, more often than not, two to four hours later, we get that rise in temperature. So we apply another dosage. Two to four hours later, we get it to go up again, and we begin to get a yo-yo effect with that fever. What is it telling us about the fever? What is the fever? It is a symptom. And somewhere beneath this symptom, oft times masked by other symptoms, will be the root cause. If we can determine the root cause of that fever and the other symptoms, and let's say that in this case it would be a bacterial organism, if we could get the right kind of medication 
to that root cause, this fever will tend to drop and stay dropped, part one. A number of years ago in one of our weekly news magazines, there was a feature article on stress. The whole front cover was on stress. One of the questions that I would ask, our, ask of you is this. What are some single word descriptors of what it's like inside an individual who is in stress? Excuse me? Chaos. Can't hear it. Chaos. 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 Sorry. What else? Single word descriptors. What does it feel like? Tension. Tension. Three or four more. Racing heart. I'm changing columns. Back to this one. What's Pain. it like inside? Pain. Pain? That could be an either. Another one. Impatient. Impatient. You're probably wondering what this other list is. Confusion. Confusion. Fear. Frustration. Fear, frustration. What else? Pressure. Pressure. Adriana? Hopelessness. Hopelessness. Now let me ask another question. How do we tend to act when we're uptight, tense, nervous, frustrated, feeling anxious? Angry? How else? Defensive. Defensive. More. Withdrawn. Let me say this. Sometimes with the word withdrawn, some people may withdraw, and at the other end, they become openly aggressive and assertive, and they're in your face, okay? What else? Depressed. 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 You come home from work, and you walk in the house, and your wife says, did you get the bread? Will you get off my back? Now, does that... Is that a result of the question? Not really. But something in him is provoking that instantaneous kind of response. If you take words like defensiveness and anger and impatience and short-fused, all of those kinds of words, we could place at the top of this column a term misbehavior. And let me state that misbehavior is an outgrowth of or manifestation of stress, and that is true at any age. Have you noticed, for example, even with little tiny children, that are uh, a child that is trying to stack blocks, and in their frustration with the stack falling over and over, what do they do? They finally knock over the whole thing in their own frustration. So regardless of the age, when this ki these kinds of feelings set in, we tend to misbehave. Not that racing heart is misbehavior, that's a physical response to stress. Not that pain is misbehavior, it's again a physiological response to stress. Depression isn't misbehavior, though you may have some individuals, if they're in a family where depression uh, shows up in pity party or sadness or being sullen, what would an insensitive person say? Oh, will you knock off the pity party? And so what is a normal response of somebody beginning to close off becomes mistreated as a misbehavior. And so when a person is feeling this and gets that kind of a negative response, the close down process is even greater. Does that make sense? Let me define misbehavior. Misbehavior is any action or behavior pattern that is outside somebody's acceptable standard or limits or parameters. What might be acceptable, for example, in one school may not be acceptable in another. What might be acceptable in one community may be totally frowned on in another. What might be acceptable in your home may not be acceptable in somebody else's. Give me, if you would, a half a dozen things we would call misbehavior from any setting, home, school, community. Screaming. Screaming. <clears throat> 
This is another one of these words where at one end you could have somebody who screams and at the other end somebody who goes totally silent, won't talk. Another one. Hitting. To hit, some kind of physical violence. What else? What's a common one in little kids who are frustrated? Breaking things. Uh, adults do that too. Sometimes they break other human beings, not very smart. Crying. Crying. What often, particularly in little children, goes with crying? Tantrum. Tantrums. If I were to ask you the question, how do you stop a tantrum, what would you say? Ignore it. Ignore it. Oh. We could ignore it, but what if the tantrum is in place to get attention? The second you ignore it, it will accelerate. What else? Let them talk widely. Let them talk. What if their talking is uh, abusive and angry and they're shouting and their language becomes foul? Well, listening to what they say, not how they say. Oh, listening to what they say and not how. Okay. What else might you do? Well, if I have to listen to your rules, I'm not talking. And it is a choice. You know, my question really isn't to give a list of how to solve it any more than this list teaches us how to solve that. You see, misbehavior, tantrums and misbehavior like fever are almost always the symptom of something else. And yet most of our effort is spent pounding on symptoms. The most The most exciting tantrum, if you can ever call a tantrum exciting, was by a 40-year-old mother, mother of eight on an empty cul-de-sac in Linden, Utah. They had called from out of state, asked my wife and me to work with them. They were struggling. We decided that we would separate. I would work with the husband. She would work with the wife. And my wife chose this empty cul-de-sac, a subdivision that had started with great gusto, curb, gutter, sidewalk, pavement, everything in place, but no real estate sales. And so there it sat for a few years empty. And so the, hus the husband and I went together, came back about an hour and a half later to that empty cul-de-sac, and sitting outside our van, in the middle of this cul-de-sac was a quilt, a very thick quilt comforter, and my wife and his wife were sitting there together. We kind of shared notes. I said, this is kind of where it's been for us in this last hour. My wife said, here's where it's been for us. Would you like to take over? And so I thought, all right, I will see if I can affix responsibility. It would be very easy, for example, to say, what does he do that bothers you? Uh, and if he was, you could give me this big list. Or if I said, what does she do that bugs you? You could give me your list. In affixing responsibility, you do it differently. So I said to the husband, what do you do that bugs your wife? See, that fixes the responsibility right where it belongs. He has the monkey. And bless his heart, he gave me 10 things. I do this, I do this, I do this, and I do that, and I do this. And the last one he said, and I actually do this one on purpose. And she said, I knew it. <laughs> and so I said, all right, thank you very much. Would you tell me what you do that bugs him? And she said, well, he does this and this and this, and he does that. And this one he says he does on purpose. And I said, I know, he already told me that. What do you do that bugs him? And he does this, this, and this, and then she added two or three more. We're up to 12 or 13 things that he was doing that bugged her. I already knew most of that. So then I said, it's very interesting. And I directed my question to her. When I asked your husband what he did that bugged you, what did, you, what did he do? Well, he listed all those and he admitted them. And I said, that's right. And I said, and when I asked you what it is you did to bug him, what did you do? And she was, who needs you? Who do you think you are anyway? Why? And then she let off the most powerful tirade of blue words. She'd have made any truck driver proud with the kind of language that came out of her mouth. 
She turned the air kind of a smoky gray at the base of Timpanogos. I kid just a little, but not much. And in that process of all of this cussing, she flipped over on that quilt, and she was kicking her feet, just like any one of my little kids had done, and smashing her fist into the quilt, still swearing at me and her husband, until her hand went off the edge of the quilt onto the asphalt. And as she bloodied her knuckles, the crying quit, the tantrum quit, and she said, please help us. Now, see, the way you stop a tantrum is to bloody their knuckles on the asphalt. <laughs> that isn't what we're talking about, is it? But you see, no matter what we could have tried to do in this circumstance, unless we could get to the root cause behind the tantrum, behind the family crisis, we could not have made progress. The thing that's fascinating to me about human behavior is that almost invariably, the root cause of misbehavior is belief-linked. In fact, the fascinating thing about the human mind is that once we have beliefs in place in this computer of ours, this computer or brain is engineered to keep us acting totally consistent with those beliefs. Let me illustrate with a couple of examples. <clears throat> Quarter to seven one morning, my oldest son walked up into our bedroom. He should have been ready for school. He was not. He walked in in his pajamas, and he said, and I quote, Dad, I don't feel very good today. I said, what seems to be the trouble, Kenneth? My stomach hurts. I said, what kind of a hurt is it? Well, I feel like I'm going to throw up, Dad. I said, is it affecting your voice? And he said, no. <laughs> Why would he change his voice when he talked to me about his not feeling well? He would change it because if he didn't sound sick, perhaps I might not believe that he was sick. I shared this story at a noon luncheon. I was a guest speaker at a women's business luncheon. And as I shared the story, a lady raised her hand. She said, I had this experience just Monday. She said, I called in sick, talked to my supervisor, told her I wasn't well, wouldn't be into work. Tuesday, I got back at my desk, and she said about 10.30, she walked by, and she said, well, you didn't sound very sick on the phone yesterday. Now, what is the supervisor training her staff to do? That when you call in, you pretend you're sick. I'm not feeling very well today, Louise. <laughs> but you better answer the phone that way, the same way every time they answer the phone that day. Let me give another example. Have you ever tried to pay a compliment to somebody who struggles with his or her worth? What do they do with the compliment? They play it down. They turn it back. For example, if I were to say to you, Adriana, and let's say that you had been up and given an extemporaneous presentation, no advance warning, and you did very, very well, but you don't believe you do well. If I paid you the compliment, what might you say back to me? It was nothing, or I don't, I don't think so. It was nothing, I don't think so. You see, we tend to take the genuine compliment and we turn it. Let me show you what happens with this graphic illustration. Suppose that this card represents a genuine compliment. If my compliment is genuine about her performance, my compliment ought to invalidate her perception of her performance. But if she has a belief in place that she doesn't do well, and the red acetate represents her belief system, it becomes a filter causing her only to see what matches her perception of herself, the validation that she did poorly. What's my challenge as one who paid the compliment? What's my challenge as a parent if a child discounts a genuine compliment? What's my challenge as a teacher if a child is always putting self down? My challenge is to interrupt this filter. So if in the face of a negative response, I would come back to this young lady and I would say, Adriana, let me tell you something about me. I never say things I don't mean. That really was a fine presentation. Can you accept that from me? That's different because now if I say something, I'm putting you down. That's very astute. <laughs> Did you feel what I said? Yeah, but I would be like, well, man. 
I would yeah, like teachers to are supposed to say that. Yeah, Parents are supposed to be complimentary. You see, the challenge is that even though my, I, I may interrupt this for a moment, they will slam the door back on the circumstance because of what they have come to believe about self. A little later, we're going to come back and talk about how to interrupt these filters in a way that will cause that individual to hear and sense and feel. They still will slam it shut, but we'll talk about that. If our beliefs are that potent, and they are, that they cause us to filter out things that are genuine and to see only things that are in error, false evidence for their own beliefs, then we ought to do something about looking at the impact, this whole impact of beliefs. We are the byproduct of the beliefs we acquire. I am who I am because of what I believe. Individuals who struggle with their worth or their self-esteem, and we choose, by the way, to use the word self-worth rather than self-esteem, suggesting that people come to beliefs about their value or their worth. If we have beliefs about self that are in error, which cause us to see a diminished view of who we really are, we need to make some changes. Parents can make a difference on a home front. Teachers can make a difference in school. Businessmen can make changes in corporate culture that affirm the worth of employees, and they'll find some pretty powerful things taking place in terms of productivity and growth and a lessened amount of employee absenteeism. Those who work with troubled youth in the caregivers of our society, and many of you fit that mold, working with those whose, whose hearts are closed down, whose minds are shut off to learning, can have the capacity to touch those lives and turn them around and give them the capacity to stand tall and bright and self-affirmed and feeling good about self. Section one deals with the subject of communication. We've been asked a number of times why we didn't call the course a course in communication, because those who take it typically end up with a, quite a, a skill in communicating, excellence in communication, if you will. If you take a look at typical courses on communication, however, if we were to call it communication, we place a mindset in those who are thinking about the course, and their answer is, well, I've already had a course on communication. So we didn't want to do that. Let's take a look at communication from its standard pattern. Communication typically is said to have two parts. The verbal portion, mine, and yours, and the nonverbal portion, which is primarily emotion, mine and yours. For years, the difference between the verbal and the nonverbal had been quantified as being 30% verbal and 70% nonverbal. A major university in the United States did research on this, and they said, we've really been in error as we've analyzed it over a large research project. It is actually 10 and 90. I noted with interest that six months after that, a national advertising agency uh, set forth this, the statistics that said it's actually even worse than that. It is 7% verbal and 93% nonverbal. I don't care if it's only 3070. When you're looking at this disparaging difference, where do we spend most of our prep time when we want to communicate with somebody? Verbal. On what we're going to say. We want to get the right words, the right intonation to our voice. We want to make sure that we have things like right kind of eye contact so that we can communicate clearly what it is we want to say. We get our logic trains all in place. We line up our ducks, if you will, so that the verbal message we send gets across the way we want it done. The problem comes, though, in what goes on beneath it. Let's say, for example, in a family setting, 
if I were to say to my wife, tuna casserole again tonight? The underneath message is, can't she cook anything else? Is she going to hear that? Well, I thought you liked tuna. Good grief, can't please him no matter what I do. Well, it pleases me, but this is the third t day in a row and I'm getting it for breakfast? Gosh, this woman's got no creativity at all. Well, you want me to be frugal. Every time I have leftovers, he scolds me. This message is taking higher priority than the verbal, isn't it? Now let me add another component. And that is that our beliefs fan my beliefs, fan my emotions on the things I verbalize. Your beliefs fan your emotions on the subject you verbalize. If you really want to change the communication process, where do you need to work? We need to work on the beliefs. That is the power source in our communication. If we really want to impact, we've got to deal with that portion. If you'll turn in section one to page three, the climate which surrounds or is emitted by an individual has a tremendous impact on what it is we hear. If the person is domineering or controlling, can you sense that and feel it in his voice? If the person is arrogant or full of pride, will you sense that? It was very interesting, two nights ago, uh, we had a small gathering at a friend's home and a guest came unannounced. He walked in, a large young man, and somebody said, well, how's the engagement? He said, well, actually it terminated. You see, uh, the girl and I were having a bit of difficulty on how leadership in the home ought to be. And I thought to myself, good for her, <laughs> that she had exited the system because what was coming off him was this arrogance, this superior insight of knowledge. You see, that is an emotional output from him, even the way he walked as he talked about this, said to me that he was literally dripping with a belief and value system that placed him in a power position in what would have been, I suspect, an abusive marriage. Now you think, my gosh, that's an awful uh, large conclusion to reach. Those emotions are betrayers. All of you know individuals who run that arrogant emotion when they talk. Uh, we have individuals who are afraid to make a decision. Can you spot them? Can you spot individuals whose emotion is one of possessiveness and ownership? Individuals who are struggling with their worth or individuals who are shy and withdrawn. You see, all of those are nonverbal indicators of where they are. On page three is a very thought-provoking poem. It says, what you meant, I thought I heard in words, but careful observation shows your words in print could have meaning different from what I caught from you. Oh, I only said, and you rephrased the spurious line, but oh, my friend, it's not the end. Feelings leave indelible markings in the mind. See, it's that nonverbal portion that goes with it. But our beliefs literally are the power source behind our communication. The question then comes, what happens when people have two different belief and value systems? Let me illustrate by talking about my background and the background of my sweet spouse. I am a Patey on my father's side. I am a Henderson on my mother's side. My wife is a Harker on her father's side and a Jensen on her mother's side. So far, we don't look very much alike. In fact, somebody said once, if you married an identical twin, you still have enough problems to drive each other straight up the wall. Let's take a look at some interesting portions of this background. My father was born in England 
and immigrated to Canada with his family when he was eight years old. My mother's parents were born in the state of Maine, immigrated to Canada via Provo, Utah in 1902. The Harkers came out of Redmond, Utah, and immigrated into Canada where Sharon's father was born. The Jensens came from Denmark via Utah and then into Canada where Sharon's mother was born. So we're all Canadians. Does that make us the same? Not too likely, is it, Jurgen? All right, let's take a look at backgrounds. In terms of uh, education, education was unimportant to my father. It was unimportant to my mother. It was very important to both my wife's parents. Let's take religion. Religion was unimportant to my father, very important to my mother. It was important to both of them. Occupation. My father was a sign painter. My mother was the daughter of a farmer. Sharon's father was a farmer by occupation. Sharon's mother was the daughter of a wealthy merchant and landowner. Let's take another one, kind of one where the rubber meets the road a little bit, money. In my family, there was one checkbook, one checking account, one signature, and it was my father's. In Sharon's family, there was two checking accounts, two checkbooks, two separate signatures, and never the twain shall meet. Two very, very different families. Now let me ask you this question relative to differences. If you were Sharon's parents and along came Ken Patey as a suitor, what would be your concerns? Would you have any? What might you think? First concern, what would it be? Occupation. Occupation. That could be a fairly serious one. This is sort of a hand-to-mouth kind of occupation in a very literal sense. Uh, but, you know, my father had done fairly well, so that might have been a problem. It literally was a problem. The day we were married, my wife was signing the marriage documents, and she began to cry. Her aunt, who was standing behind us, said, oh, isn't it tender? Sharon's crying at her own wedding. Now, the assumption was that it was tears of joy, joy and happiness and how exciting. In reality, Sharon said to me years later, I was crying when I saw you write sign painter as your occupation because I thought, have I given up in the marriage to this man, though I love him, have I given up the possibility of education for our children? You see, that was a concern. It had never come up prior to that. What other concern might there be? Religion. Religion. Oh, my. That could be a serious one. My three older brothers had decided they didn't want any interest in religion. Uh, there were only three of us, of eight, who had any interest in religion. Could that have been a problem? Yes. I'll say it could have been. What else? Money, power. Money mm -hmm. and power. Mm -hmm. You know, this one is listed very frequently as the most common reason for what? Divorce. 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 You know, I really don't believe that. I really believe it is the final catalyst. It is the final excuse that is used. It's the one that tips the scale, if you will. All right, I've had enough. And off they go. But it was the end result or the end piece to another mounting puzzle of problems. And that was sort of the last straw. What about education? That could have been a real big one. You see, and in my family, my father only went to the eighth grade. Is that typical for somebody born in 1904? It really is. But my oldest, my oldest brother quit in the ninth grade. 
My second brother quit in the 10th grade. My third brother quit. I decided at the end of my 11th grade, I wasn't going back to 12th grade at all. I literally lay in bed the morning school sort of started. And when the bell rang, I was watching the clock. And when that large hand hit the top and the small hand hit the nine, which was a wonderful time for school, I said to myself, all my buddies have to go to school and I get to stay home and work. That didn't sound too good. <laughs> so I kind of course corrected and by 925 I was at school, walked into the door to the office and said I'd like to go back to school. The principal walked out and said very inappropriately, what are you doing back at school? I thought you were going to dig ditches for the rest of your life. Now you see that was not a very affirming thing, but that kind of did something to me and I thought I'll do what I choose to do. I was kind of a resistant kid, and I went back. I played, though. I really didn't work. It was kind of a social thing for me. In fact, when I graduated from high school, if I had had two percentage points less, I would not have graduated. Just barely made it. There wouldn't have been a university in the world who would have accepted me as a student. However, at age 25, I kind of got a spark inside me that said, I really want to do something about education. I was working with youth, and I was encouraging them to get a college education, and here I was barely a high school graduate. And I decided to listen to my own sermon, and off I went to college. The university said, well, sometimes with people who are older, who come back to school, but whose grade points were very, very low, maybe it was a matter of motivation and not smarts. And so they gave me a one-semester trial on academic probation to see how I would do. I was grateful for that. And a 3-7 at the end of that first semester took me off the probation line, and I graduated five years later, having chosen to do it in five instead of four, having purchased and uh, finished a home, uh, two new cars, five children, worked 52 hours a week, and went to school full time. Was it a matter of intelligence? No. It was a matter of a value system that had shifted to where education became something that was important, something that we could then tie our children to. Sharon was very grateful for that kind of a shift. Well, we have a lot of differences. There is a page in this section if you wanted to kind of compare. Now, those of you who are already married, you've got to be very careful about this because the dice cast on a lot of this already. Anyway, the last part I would mention is that the most significant element in the communication process is the emotional climate that accompanies it. If we are not careful about how we communicate, we are sending messages different than our words are saying. Section two is a discussion of the mind, how it works. The human mind actually receives about 100 million pieces of input every second of every day, 24 hours a day. How would you like to have to process and make decisions about all of that kind of input? We don't need to do that because of the way the mind operates. Let's take a look at a diagram of the mind. If you'll turn to page two of section two, you'll see this diagram. This one is slightly proportioned differently than yours to fit the screen. We're going to talk about the conscious mind. This is a data processing center. We're going to talk about memory storage or our memory banks. And we're going to talk about the reticular formation. The reason we don't have to process all of that information, that 100 million pieces of input every second, is because of the reticular formation. It is a filter that is about two-thirds the size of your own little finger. It sits at the top of the spinal cord in the brain stem, right where it joins to the cerebral cortex. So as that spinal cord comes up, it flanges out for that filter and then makes the connector. The only thing we have to deal with is the decision really of that filter system. It has an alert list. The only things you will deal with consciously are things that are of value or things that are a threat, things that are unusual 
or things that you have programmed your mind to watch for. Let's give an example. If you were to take the sense of sound, and here we have sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, and we've added another one, sixth sense. Some people have that instinctive, intuitive sense, very vibrant and very alive in them, and they will pick up things. If a message of sound comes into the mind, right here at the base of this filter, it splits into two copies. One copy goes into the filter for comparison against the alert list. The other copy goes around the filter to the sensor receptors in the conscious mind for sound. The one that goes around the filter, before the sound reaches the brain, the filter system has done its business and sends an alert to the conscious mind about what it should do or should not do. Let me illustrate with an example. When I was about 12 years of age, I went out to a little town in southern Alberta by the name of Barnwell. Barnwell, Alberta had a massive metropolis population of 500 at the time. My grandparents and my aunts and uncles lived several miles north of Barnwell in a farming area. Barnwell had a train station. And obviously, if you have a train station, you also have train tracks. Canadian National Rail System went through Barnwell. I didn't know then when it went through. I just knew that it did it. In front of that was Trans-Canada Highway that went from Vancouver clear out to the Maritime Provinces. Right across from the train station was an old service station, the kind that had two glass jars the kind that you would pull the handle back and forth and pump the gasoline up into the jar. Then you'd put the nozzle in the tank and count down the number of notches, and then you'd pay your 35 cents for filling your tank. Wouldn't those be nice days? Right off here to the side was a three-story above-ground farmhouse that belonged to a family by the name of LeBaron. I stayed in the upstairs front bedroom of that third floor with their son, Richard, who was my age. Now, how many of you, just out of curiosity, have spent time in the country? Most of you, at some point or another. What are typical sounds for the country at night? Animal, Animal sounds, crickets, coyote, owls. owls, and they're a real hoot too, aren't they? <laughs> what else would you hear? Frogs. Yes, and even the wiggles of tadpoles in a stagnant pond that wasn't too far away. All kinds of wonderful sounds. Uh, a weasel in the chicken coop was one I remember one night, and uh, the attendant cursings of my uncle, the screen door slamming to the side, and all of that mayhem and squawking of those chickens, and then the deafening and then silencing sound of a shotgun blast, and then there was no more weasel, and the chickens quieted for the rest of the night. Those were typical farm sounds. I understood those, the cow mooing and everything else. What I was not prepared for, however, was the train. What do trains do one quarter of a mile from the crossing? There was a crossing just a half a block down from the LeBaron residence. And of course, the sign here that said we had a train crossing. What do trains do about a quarter of a mile from the crossing? They blow the whistle. In those days, it was the old steam-powered, steam coal-fired engine. That was enough in itself. That was enough to wake you up anyway, but that steam whistle let loose. And when that sound came in, I was up off that mattress just like a rocket, and I said, what in the world is that? And my friend Richard said, it's just the eastbound freight. And I said, how often does that happen? He says, every morning at 4.45. And I grumbled and went back to sleep. Now, a question for you. How long do you think it would take for me not to hear that train? Guesses. A week. Two weeks? What else? Two or three days. Two or three days? Yeah. Somebody else? Yeah. A, month. a month? You know, the brain is a very interesting piece of equipment. It would take you two or three days. It would take you two weeks. It would take you about a month. I had a friend that bought a condo. I don't know how the real estate agent got him to that condo three times as he viewed it and find, signed the papers without letting him see the Union Pacific trunk line that was 25 feet off his back fence. 
he called me the next morning and he said, Ken, I've made a terrible mistake. I said, what's wrong, Jim? He said, the freight trains burn through here all night long. I don't think I will ever be able to sleep through them. I saw him six weeks later. I don't think he'd slept. He had the biggest bags under his eyes. He sold the home at a loss. Actually moved out and just left it. Get what you can. I've got to get out of here. Well, let's talk about how this works. The message of sound will come in. It goes to the alert list. The other copy goes around heading for here, but before it reaches the sensor receptors, the alert list will do its job. Here's how the conversation would go in the reticular formation. Is this train whistle a value? Oh, yes, train whistles are always a value. Is it a threat? Yes, if there's a train in Patey's bedroom, he's in big trouble. Is it unusual? Yes, we don't hear trains at 4.45 in the morning. Tell everybody upstairs to wake up. And so the alert is sent. This message comes screaming into the conscious mind, but I'm already awake because I've been alerted by the reticular formation of a threat to my life. Well, now the second morning, I heard it, pulled the pillow over my head, grumbled a bit, and went back to sleep. Third morning, I slept right on through. But did I hear the train? The answer is yes, but here's what happens in the filter. Is this train whistle a value? Yes, train whistles are always a value. Is it a threat? No, he's in Barnwell. Is it unusual? No, train whistle always blows at 4.45 in the morning in Barnwell. Tell everybody upstairs to sleep on through. And so this message then comes screaming in after the directive to the mind to ignore it. And so I sleep right on through, no longer hearing the train. Now I have a question, ladies. Do any of you have a reasonably n young, newbornish kind of a kitty? Anybody have one of those? How old? Well, she's 15, now it's almost 16. <laughs> when your husband says, I didn't hear the baby cry, do you think he's a liar? <laughs> Ladies, how many of you have wondered when your husband said, I didn't hear the baby cry, you, you did too? <laughs> how many think your husband's lied to you all these years? You know something? The way the mind works, if you're the one that gets up on a regular basis, to care for that child, to change it, to feed it, nurse it, whatever it is. If you're the one who does it, he will never wake up unless there's a disruption to your pattern. Let me interrupt this story to ask a question. How many of you have a particular time in the morning that you wake up with no alarm? A set, precise, to the minute time. What time, Brandon? 6.30. 6.30, not 6.31? Mm -hmm. Not 6.29? I don't even set my alarm anymore. Oh. How many else have that kind? What time is yours? 545. Anybody have a weird time like 528 or 611? Does anybody have kind of a weird time or do you all wear on these five minute characters? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have a, an, alar an alarm system that resets itself like your computers for daylight saving time? Anybody? Pardon? I resets for the weekend. Resets for the week. <laughs> and resets for the weekend, Friday night. And it doesn't go off, right? Isn't that wonderful? You see, the brain works that way. You can set it for whatever you want. A lot of people don't know that. But you can literally set that alarm. Now let's come back to the baby. I know of a couple who had twins, a boy and a girl. They decided that since this was such a heavy duty with getting up in the night with two children, that if the boy woke up, he would get up and take care of the boy, and the wife, if the girl woke, she would get up and care for the girl. When the boy cried, the wife never heard it. When the girl cried, the husband never heard it. Now let's talk again about precise time. Let's say, for example, that the wife is the one who gets up to tend the baby, and she doesn't get out of bed until the baby's cried for 21 seconds. And she pulls the cover back, she swings her feet out onto the floor, grabs her house coat, puts it on, walks across the hall, it's another 17 seconds, time she gets to the baby's room. As soon as she opens the door and the baby hears that handle turn, baby stops crying. And so now we are 38 seconds and the baby quits crying and husband doesn't hear it. If the mother, however, and you want to test this on your husbands, try this. Wait 27 seconds, poke while you put on your robe, so that it's about 40, 45 seconds, and that will be unusual. 
and because it is an unusual amount of time, something must be wrong. And the reticular formation, because it is an unusual time sequence, will alert you and the husband will wake up. You could lay right there in bed and watch him. <laughs> and after the time it would normally take you to get to the baby, he will stir. Because it isn't, something's wrong here. It's not working right. That is really how precise the mind is. The reticular formation also has another interesting task. If you look over on this part of your page, you will find a statement that says the reticular formation will keep you acting consistent with your beliefs. How many of you, for example, have been to, or for information, how many have been to the entertainment form of hypnotism? Any of you been to one? Orem High School used to invite a hypnotist every other year as a student body assembly. I had three children in the school, three daughters, and one of the boys that went up on the stage was a football player. His name was Max. And he went up there with the group, was hypnotized, and that skillful man had hypnotized the group, and then under hypnosis gave the kids instructions. I went up onto the stage of the Capitol Theater in my hometown of Lethbridge, Alberta. When Ravine was there, I was 16. Two of my friends and I went up to prove that he couldn't hypnotize us, and he didn't. And we stood there looking like idiots on the side while he had the other 17 under hypnosis. He got their attention and just ping, there they were. And one by one, he went down that row of 17 individuals, giving them instructions, post-hypnotic suggestions, if you will, so that after they were awake, a cue word would bring them into some kind of action. Or he, in some cases, literally gave them an assignment, or in some cases, actually a belief. Max was very interesting at Orem High. My daughter said he was told, under hypnosis, not to sit on the edge of the hardwood stage because somebody had spilled a tube of superglue. And when he was out of hypnosis, the first thing the man did said, would you please sit there, someone to the audience. As soon as everybody was positioned where he wanted them, he said, come back up for a second. Guess what? That young man could not move. He tried pushing this way. He tried pulling up on his leg. And of course, up to that moment, he'd just been sitting there watch, being watched by his peers and all the football team. And when he couldn't lift his leg, his face went a little bit red. And somebody said, hey, Max. And this kid couldn't move. Why couldn't he? Could he tell you why? See, you say he believed he was done, uh, fastened with super glue, but consciously does he know that? You see, under hypnosis, the message goes to the subconscious. One of the cutest was ha what happened in the Capitol Theater. A beautiful lady, the most elegant I had seen in the theater. She was wearing clothes like right out of the loft. You know, one of these exquisite, expensive lady stores. Gold rings, gold bracelet, gold earrings, necklace, high heels, absolutely a head turner, gorgeous. And he said to her, and for want of remembering the Q word, Ravine said to her something like this, when you hear the word sunrise, I made that part up, sunrise. When you hear the Q word, wherever you are in the audience, you will stand up on your chair and crow like a rooster. <laughs> One of the favorite ones that is done is to tell an individual that a glass on a table, just a simple little glass like this one, about seven or eight ounces, weighs 500 pounds. And that glass would be set on a table somewhere on the stage. About 20 minutes after the performance had started and everybody was in the audience, Ravine used the Q word, like all oh, the other day at sunrise, and everybody's head turned to see where this lady was. We all watched, you know, we paid to see this. And by the time I got focused where she was, what happens, by the way, to a theater seat when you stand up? She folded it back down. She climbed up on it with her high heels. And she got herself perched. That's the only word. And when she was balanced on that wobbly seat, she began to do this. And she gave the most pitiful rooster crow I have ever seen. I've been on a farm. I know what they sound like. And it wasn't her. But she gave that sound. And only when she finished the crow, did she recognize what she was doing? And it was, oh my gosh, why didn't you hold me in my seat? No way, that's why we came, right? <laughs> to enjoy this. The most interesting one is the glass. I have not seen this one. I have read it. I have heard about it. It's been talked about a lot. The most macho male who was told that the glass weighed 500 pounds, 
and who's now sitting on the stage waiting for whatever's going to happen to him, is told by the hypnotist, would you please pick up the glass? He walked over, got hold of the glass, and as he tried to lift it, couldn't. He got it with two hands. He got it this way. He tried this way, and with no success, he tried to lift the glass. What would you think? Kind of silly. To amplify, now if this is a macho male, and they always pick the most macho. They picked a, whisk of a wisp of a girl and sent her to do it. She walked over, picked up the glass. I like this particular one because it lets me take a drink during the performance. Set it back down. Now the man is told to do it again. He still can't lift it. He will perspire and can't lift the glass. What do you think the audience says? And it's always shouted out by somebody. Yeah, wimp's a good one. That's what his friends would say, wimp. But what would? Fake, phony. And somebody hollers it out. A university team was brought into such a performance after that shout of fake or phony and told that they were going to, and it was announced that they would do an experiment. They hooked up electrodes to the man's biceps. These are the ones that let you do the lifts and the curls. And they asked him then, with that electrode hooked up to a dial that registered upward thrust in foot pounds, they asked him to lift the glass. He tried. The dial registered 100 foot pounds of upward thrust. What should 100 foot pounds of upward thrust or lift do to an eight ounce glass? <laughs> It'd be gone, wouldn't it? Could I invite you to come up for a minute? Would that be all right, Eric? Put your hands against mine, would you? Okay. Now move me. Now don't get nasty, but just move me. <laughs> Why am I not moving? You weigh <laughs> I weigh more than thank you. <laughs> True. <laughs> Why didn't I move? You had better position than he did. He was pushing back on me. Whatever pressure he put on me, I matched it. I was afraid he was going to do one of these, you know, and you go flat on your face. <laughs> thank you very much. Is the glass fighting back? No. no, it is not. So scientifically, if 100 foot-pounds of upward thrust is being exerted on an 8-ounce glass to lift it upward, what has to be occurring? There has to be at least 100 foot-pounds of downward pressure. They hooked up electrodes to the man's tricep, had him lift again, and the upward thrust was 100 foot-pounds of upward on the biceps, the triceps were registering a downward thrust of 105, keeping the man acting totally consistent with his belief. Whether the belief was true or false, which was it? False. False. And whether it is known to him consciously or unknown, which is it? Unknown. You see, the human mind is engineered literally to keep us acting consistent with our beliefs, whether they are true or false, known or unknown. So that becomes a very, very interesting challenge. Let's put it in a, another example. How many of you have heard of Roger Bannister? Who was he, Steve? Or Jeff? He was the first to break the four minute mile. The first to run a mile in under four minutes. Why hadn't anybody done it? Because shortly after he broke it, many others followed. See, the belief was you couldn't run a mile in under four. In the same year that he broke the four-minute mile in official race, there were some 12 to 15 others who also broke it. I think there were five in one race alone that people broke that, that race limit in under four minutes. It is a function of our belief system. And when we have a belief in place, we are locked according to that belief, into a certain kind of conduct or a certain level of performance. It is literally that powerful. Let's take a look now at memory banks. Our memory banks, and this is a very interesting thing, the purpose here is not to show you where they are, it's simply to show the interrelated functions of the conscious mind, the memory banks, and the reticular formation. There are some that wonder if the memory, a memory cell 
is literally like a hologram. How many of you know what a hologram is? A hologram is a picture that can be projected into a fine mist in a, in, in a room and you see the, the image of the person or the uh, picture that's being projected into the mist. But if you got close enough, you will find that every droplet of moisture has the same whole picture. It's part of the picture, but it also is the whole picture. That's holographic in nature. Isn't that a fascinating thing? We have a similar thing in the human body. Our cells, each cell in the human body can give to scientists today what piece of information? Genetic the genetic coding. The entire genetic coding of an individual is found in any single cell of that individual. 80,000 cells in this hand, or whatever there are, every one of those cells has the programming to produce insulin. Did you know that? But it doesn't. Only the pancreas does. But the coding is in all of them. That's kind of like a holographic concept in terms of human cells, isn't it? Memory is fascinating to us, though, in some very other profound kinds of ways. Do you know that our brain literally records everything we experience? It is a powerful video recorder. It is a powerful audio recorder. It records it all. Everything you experience, important, unimportant, is recorded. You think, well, my gosh, we're run out of tape. They don't have to change tapes like they do for this kind of a performance, but the, it just keeps recording. I had a couple of very fascinating experiences with my children. My oldest son came down to my office. We have 11 children, unheard of number in many families today. And when you have that many children, no matter how close or widely spread, you have varying interests in television. Pro programming. So we had to have a television location and a VCR for the older kids, one for the middle range and one for the children, the little tiny kitties, to watch Disney or other cartoon uh, programs. Well, on this particular evening, a knock on my office door and my son said, Dad, all three other places are being used. Are you busy or could I watch a movie in your office? I was doing a sorting project on a counter. And I said, help yourself, just keep, kind of keep it low. So he positioned himself in my easy chair, put his feet up on my desk to enjoy himself. I was working over here at the counter with no intent at all to pay anything to mind about that movie. And all of a sudden, I became aware I was watching the movie. And I said to myself, hmm, that's where he did this. And I spun around in my chair and said, yep, that's what it was. And I turned back. And for the next 90 minutes, I found myself double checking what I was seeing here and what was playing on the VCR and TV set. And I was never wrong. The part that fascinated me, it had been several years since I had seen the movie only one time, the night I had recorded it, and then it went into my library. And yet all of that detail was still there. I'm going to hum a few bars from a song. And I'd like you to tell me, after I'm finished, not about my performance, <laughs> what it is went through your mind. <laughs> what did you see? Tell me what you saw in your mind, please. Well, isn't that from the Fiddler on the Roof? Or it is from Fiddler on the Roof. Who's, who was doing what? Wasn't it the, the guy singing? What he was singing and dancing? If I were a rich man. I can't quite do it like him, and he is cuter, too. Um, who was it? Tevia. Where was he? In the barn. Where in the barn? He's in the loft. Who has seen it recently? Not a one. How long ago? How long ago for you? Ten years. Ten years ago. Interesting. The memory, it, it's all there. We can pull it back. We were on a trip to Canada. I'd asked the children, again, to select a range of videos. We had a VCR and TV in the van. 
and for an 800 mile trip, it's great. And the older kids had watched, the middle range kids had watched, it was now time for the little kids and somebody grabbed one of the older range videos and I said, wait a second, it's time for the little ones. And uh, I heard a voice at the back said, I want to watch Bambi. And in went the tape. But I didn't hear anybody moving to let my youngest son get up there to watch it. And I said, are you going to make room for Aaron or aren't you? And little Aaron piped up and he said, and I looked in my mirror and here he was laying on the back deck of the van with his arms full of his feet crossed over. He said, I don't need to go up there, Dad. I'm watching the movie in my head. <laughs> see, and of course, the little kids, they watch them umpteen dozen times. <laughs> and he could see it all. Our memory banks are wonderful. We can very, very easily have memory triggered. How many of you will have something said, or you hear a few words of a song, or you smell something, and you're back 20 years ago? Now, you have to be old enough to be back 20 years. <laughs> The greatest eliciter of memory is smell. The olfactory nerves bring back memory more quickly than anything else. Okay, let's talk about another facet of this memory process. Not only does the mind record what we experience, it actually makes two recordings. So here is an event, and the two recordings are, number one, the actual event exactly the way it occurred. Nothing changed. The other recording is our perception of the event, which may or may not be accurate. What would make our perception of an event be different from the actual? What you believe. What you believe. Your beliefs will impact your perception, causing you to see it in a different light than if you didn't have that belief. Now there's another element. Not only does it make two recordings, it records the emotion that accompanies the event. The stronger the emotion, the deeper the memory impress. In fact, from the television series The Body Human, produced for PBS, the doctor who talked about it said that the brain produces some three to four thousand different chemicals and that each emotion has its own chemical output. For example, and you will know some of these, what is the chemical that is released into the human body when you are frightened? Epinephrine. Epinephrine? Another common name for it? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. Tell me the physiological changes that occur when adrenaline dumps into your system. Your heart rate is up. Then that last one. Okay, uh, the digestion process literally will slow, right? You get confused. You say you get confused? Confusion, so you have less blood going to the brain. Uh, interestingly enough, without adrenaline, that would be the case. Because what would happen, what happens under that is the brain goes on garner mode. What does it mean to garner? It means to gather every little piece of information. So under threat, we're trying to track it all, all the information. And the reason the heart rate goes up is to compensate for that. What literally happens is this. Have you noticed that when you get frightened, what happens on your arms? You get chills. And what does your body do? What? Shakes. The hair stands on it. See, the, the, the surface of the body goes choo, and the hair follicle just pops up like this, okay? You got a little goose bump. What it is, is the blood vessels on the surface of your entire body, in the squeezing of all those surface muscles, squeezes off the capillaries so that if you get hurt, you won't bleed badly. At the same time, the artery system to the brain actually enlarges and engorges and sends more blood to the brain so that we can process all that extra data that we're receiving. We want to track all the sounds we hear, what are our escape routes, what have I been taught to do, and we're, we're trying to track all of these options that we have. The brain, by the way, uses 45% of the body's power supply at normal time. 
But under threat, under fear, it actually needs more power to process all that extra data that it's pulling in. How many know what a pyracantha bush is? Pyracantha is an innocuous looking hedge with little tiny leaves and it looks so nice and so pretty. But hidden in the leaves are needles that are about this long and they are as stiff as literal steel needles and very, very fine sharp points. If you were to run through a pyracantha bush in play, playing with your friends, playing tag, and you made the mistake of running through a hedge, you would have yourself with cuts and you would be bleeding profusely because it will cut you deeply. And so you'd be bleeding all over the place. However, if you were fearful and un without awareness ran through the same bush with the effect of adrenaline, you will find the scratches and just a little droplet or two of blood here and there, but you won't bleed like you would. Why? Because of that process caused by the chemical release into the system, tightens the surface capillaries so they don't bleed, sends that extra power supply to the brain. Your heart rate will be up. Interesting process. Every emotion we experience has its own. The doctor said kind of interestingly that the emotion which has the greatest harm potential for a human being is one when a person becomes angry. Now, I want to differentiate between the emotion of anger and the action form of that word, which is angry. If you look up the word anger in a dictionary, it just talks about it being an emotion. If you look up angry, it is an action form of the word. Hate is an emotion. Hatred is an action form. It'd be kind of interesting to look at several of those. But the stronger the emotion, the deeper the memory impress because memory is a process of a chemical etching in the brain. Now, if you want to have something cement in your mind pretty deeply, replay it. The thing that's fascinating is that when you replay an event, a past history event, and you replay it, the second you replay the event, the emotion again occurs, and the emotion triggers the release of the chemical. The chemical then re-etches the memory experience, and it's doubly impressed in your mind. Let's take a person who has a, a negative experience at school, is embarrassed, a lot of embarrassment and chiding from his peers, and he has that chemical etch of that experience, being indelibly and brilliantly impressed in his mind. He's on his way home from school. Somebody says, aha, you sure looked like a fool in school. Now he reruns it again. The emotion comes, the chemical is released, and the memory again is retraced. And this etching process creates not just a little tiny hairline, but each time it plays, it etches it deeper and more deeply and more deeply than before. When he gets home, his mother says, how was school? If he thinks through the process again, that same thing occurs. And what might have been a little tiny trace a little fine line memory etch becomes a Grand Canyon memory gorge that can be triggered at any time. One of the reasons it's important to understand this process is that when a past event is triggered, a person may not even know what triggered it, but once it is triggered and that chemical is released, they may think it is a current new experience. When in fact, if they could stop long enough to kind of monitor what is happening, they'll recognize the whole thing is a replay in the mind. The interesting thing about the mind is that the mind does not differentiate between a real experience and one that is vividly imagined. So even the imagination, the thinking through of something can trigger a fear producing moment which triggers the dumping of a chemical into the brain. Memory. Very, very interesting process.